The regular meeting of the Public Health and Safety Committee will now begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this regularly scheduled meeting of the Public Health and Safety Committee for June 10th, 2021. My name is Philippe Cunningham and I am the chair of this committee. As we begin, I will note for the record that this meeting has remote participation by members of the Minneapolis City Council and city staff as authorized under Minnesota statute section 13D.20, excuse me, 021 due to the declared local public health emergency. The city will be reporting and posting this meeting to the city's website and YouTube channel as a means of increasing public access and transparency. This meeting is public and subject to the open meeting, Minnesota open meeting law. At this time, I will ask the clerk to please call the roll so we can verify a quorum for this meeting. Council member Gordon. Here. Council member Ellison. Council member Cano. Council member Palmisano. Present. Vice chair Fletcher. Here. Council member Ellison. Council member Cano. And Chair Cunningham. Present. There are four members present. Let the ref record reflect that we have a quorum. With that, colleagues, the agenda for today's meeting is before us. We have five items, one consent item, and then four discussion items. So we'll begin with item number one, uh, which is accepting the low bid from 24 Restore Inc. Uh, for bids for commercial, commercial board up services and um, accepting the second low bid from Right Away Construction Corporation. Um, and so both of these are for uh, $300,000 for the services with up to four one year extensions agreed upon by both parties. So with that, um, is there any discussion on this item? All right, right, I'm not seeing any uh, discussion. So will the clerk please call the roll? Council member Gordon. Aye. Council member Ellison. Council member Cano. Council member Palmisano. Aye. Vice chair Fletcher. Aye. And chair Cunningham. Aye. There are four ayes. All right, that motion carries to approve that item, item number one. And with that, we will move to our discussion items. Uh, colleagues, again, we will have four discussion items for today. Um, I'm sorry, I think one. Yes, uh, actually three, my apologies. All right, so uh, first off, we will have receiving and filing an update report on COVID-19, which will be given by our health commissioner, Gretchen Musicand. Commissioner, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, Chair Cunningham. So uh, we've got a PowerPoint here. We've got some statistics to share and some um, challenges before us and, and opportunities uh, to work with. So if you could go to the first slide, please. As you'll see, we have made some real progress when it comes to uh, the amount of COVID cases in our community. In fact, we have not seen numbers like we have today um, since April 2020. So very close to the beginning of the uh, pandemic here in Minneapolis. Um, we saw the same number of cases as we're seeing today. And between those two times, we have seen many more cases. So things are really uh, turning in a, in a really good direction. As is true with any statistic, uh, there's uh, more information that's hidden from view when we uh, group everything together. And so uh, we have been able to look at the cases that we do have and uh, the number of folks that are unvaccinated who are represented in those cases. And so we see that uh, the rate amongst unvaccinated people is nearly three times higher. And so it's really important for us to continue to urge people to get vaccinated. We know that the opportunities for 
Um, young people 12 to 16 is, is fairly new. And so over the summer would be a great time for uh, those young people to get vaccinated and add to our overall community protection. We are seeing um, a, a leveling off um, and uh, diminishment of ICU admissions, stable and at a lower rate and deaths have continued to decrease. And so this is really evidence um, of the vaccine working. And we also see it as evidence that fewer people are experiencing severe COVID illnesses, even if they test positive. And so based on these and, and other findings, um, citywide improvements that we have had, Mayor Fry was able to lift the local mask mandate last week. In spite of that, unvaccinated people are still strongly encouraged to wear a mask, especially in indoor public spaces. And of course, we know that businesses are making their own decisions and we support those decisions in terms of asking people to wear masks uh, inside their businesses if, if they so choose. Next slide, please. So vaccinations are really uh, the key underpinning of, of this improvement. And we have vaccines available in many locations across the city now. Certainly uh, vaccination opportunities that are provided through the health department, but also the ones that are available through pharmacies, through healthcare providers. The state has a number of, of opportunities that are provided, uh, community-based organizations. And so um, this is helping as of June 7th, nearly 81% of those who are 15 or older in Minneapolis had at least one shot and almost 72% of that same group were fully vaccinated. Our part of that story, uh, we have to date administered uh, over 24,000 doses in our um, health department run clinics. Next slide, please. So we're presenting this slide in an effort to show you um, where these many sources of vaccine are concentrated. And so you will see that in those areas that are in highest need um, of more vaccinations, there have been many opportunities provided. I do want to say a little something about the numbers that are shown here. Uh, we have, and I can go into it if you have questions, but we have some uh, challenges in terms of the data um, that we have uh, as we determine these numbers. And so these numbers that you're seeing here reflected by zip code are numbers of people vaccinated um, per the entire population. And so that means that includes children who are not yet eligible to receive vaccine. It's a little bit different number than I used on the previous page when I talked about uh, those who are older than 15, 15 or older. And uh, that's, we're just able to do that on a citywide level, that earlier number that uh, with the denominator of the 15 and older. And if we go down to the zip codes, it's a little more challenging. And so we have a different number. What is Helpful, I think, in these numbers, nonetheless, is just comparing one to another and seeing where some places are doing better than others. So our current areas of focus include the uh, five zip codes, 55404, 55407, 55411, 55412, and 55454. So the two that are even amongst those five of highest um, concentration for our efforts are 55411 and 55454. All right, so the dots on this map represent clinics that have been offered by all sorts of folks, uh, healthcare providers, pharmacies, the state, ourselves, the county, and others. But you can see we are all aligned in focusing our efforts in those areas that need it the most. Next slide, please. So this, uh, this graphic shows us that we continue to have racial disparities 
And um, one, one way to look at this graph is to see that we have had gentle increases all along and um, it hasn't quite flattened out and plateaued. So that's good. Everyone's improving in their vaccines, uh, but we do see that the Latino community and the black community within Minneapolis have a much lower rate of vaccination than any of the other groups that are listed there. So maybe because it's hard to see the little numbers, I'll just say a couple things about what the numbers. As of June 7th, 71% of white residents have received at least one dose compared to 32%, 32.5% of black residents and 37.5% of Latinx residents. Next slide, please. So in the clinics that we are offering, we uh, had started out by um, asking people to register ahead of time, but we're completely doing walk-ins. In addition, people can register if they want to ahead of time, but we're taking walk-ins at all of the, the clinics that we're offering. And you can see there our uh, regular ongoing um, locations are the Davis Center and Park Avenue Methodist Church. We also uh, have a partnership with Salvation Army and, and have a date coming up. We have also offered vaccine uh, through the schools as uh, they have as Pfizer has become available down to age 12. And so we've already given over 600 doses and we'll be giving second doses to those same individuals in June. In addition to those regular uh, spots in the in the first bullet and uh, the the work we're doing in high schools, we are also uh, working with community organizations to do some pop-up space, some pop-up clinics. And so we've been doing some in public housing and you'll see there listed, I believe that the Seward Tower East and West have already uh, happened and the Boston Terrace will be happening later this week. We will be at the Pride Festival. We are going to be at Juneteenth and we are working with two charter schools, the Yinghua Academy, and Harvest Best Academy in North Minneapolis. Next, please. A key part of this work is to continue to get information out to people in terms of the importance, the availability, the acceptability of vaccines. And so we have put together a, a, a new a frame, if you will, for communicating at this point in the pandemic. And that uh, frame is your community health starts with you. And you can see the, the banner at the bottom as an example of what we'll be using. The tactics that we're using, uh, we, are do we are purchasing Facebook ads, targeting residents of some of those zip codes that I mentioned. We have also prepared a social media toolkit in five languages. And uh, we are also getting the word out, continuing to, continuing to get our word out through cultural radio shows. Uh, we have um, <clears throat> really leveraged the work of our health inspectors uh, to work out, to work not only with restaurants, but also other businesses in key corridors to get the word out, help people understand where to get vaccines help them sign up. And then we are also working with um, <clears throat> civil rights to develop uh, more information about the use of sick and safe time for uh, getting a vaccine and also for uh, the time after a vaccine if there are any after effects that occur. Next, please. So um, one of our key ways of working is to uh, partner with, with folks who are trusted messengers in the community. And uh, we have a social media ready, shorter video uh, with Somali Physician Association. We're planning a meeting or a Facebook live event with Latinx physicians and Unidos Minnesota youth uh, coming up in July. And some 30 second clips have been prepared by our uh, community partners on specific vaccine concerns. And those are done in language. 
And then uh, we are also doing door knocking to promote vaccine events. Uh, we're using community food distributions as another opportunity to get the word out. And we are always promoting testing as well as vaccinations. All right, next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit more about the work that our health inspectors have done uh, reaching out to businesses. Uh, they have weekly emails that go out providing information both for businesses and employees. Uh, they have conducted door-to-door -door in language outreach to over 60 licensed businesses in priority areas and you can see some of the areas listed there. And just an example, uh, we um, have a regular vaccine event at Park Avenue United Methodist Church. And so uh, some of our health inspectors, one in particular, um, Justo Garcia, uh, has gone in person to visit nearby retail space, the Mercado Central and other places to promote the vaccine clinic, to recruit people to come and to experience something that is uh, available and accessible. Next, please. So I want to talk a little bit about testing. Testing has really slowed. We would say it has slowed to a trickle and it's still important uh, and we are continuing to offer free testing opportunities. And so to the extent that you can uh, help publicize these, uh, we would really appreciate it. It's important, as we noted, at, as I noted at the beginning, when we have uh, rates of infection that are much higher in unvaccinated communities, that we continue to see testing in those very communities so we can help them uh, protect uh, others in their community from infection should they get infected. Our citywide testing positivity rate is 5.8%. We would prefer to see it under five. So we're still hovering at, um, at a rate that, that is uh, higher than we would like, obviously. And we're continuing to explore. We have these events as you see listed there, but we're continuing to explore other ideas and options uh, about how to get testing around. And of course we know in addition to the in-person testing events, there are many other ways to get tested, including ordering a free home, at home saliva test kit, visiting your healthcare provider, or going to one of the state uh, events. And all of that is available, all that information is available on our website. Next, please. So, for, for much of this outbreak, we've struggled with resources to respond as we felt uh, the need required. Of late, we have some resources. So um, we have just received our uh, confirmation that we have gotten this uh, grant from the CDC, um, this COVID Health Disparities Grant. This is a grant that was made available to both the state and a number of cities across the country. And so in Minnesota, Minneapolis was the only city uh, that had an opportunity to apply directly. And so we have been informed that we have received that. And you can see here some of our key activities will be testing, um, providing, purchasing, protective equipment to the extent that that's necessary, addressing food insecurity, addressing mental health and homelessness, uh, health disparity data collection and communication support. So some of those areas that are still so important as we try and get to a closer to the finish line in terms of vaccination and then uh, being able to continue to provide the support for people that, that have been impacted by this um, outbreak. Secondly, and, and just of note that CDC funding is um, comes from the Coronavirus Relief and Response Supplemental Appropriation Act, and it is not ARP funds. So I know that there's a lot of federal money coming in right now and it's hard to keep them all straight, but I just wanted to point that out. We have also received funds uh, from the state and I believe uh, you, you may have already been informed about that. We've just been informed that we have a little bit longer to spend that money. 
So uh, it, originally we had thought we might need to spend it all in this year, but as you can see, we've been given a much longer time frame in which to spend that. And we're still working on um, the details of what will be allowable expenditures, but as you can see, uh, vaccination clinics, community outreach, education, program staffing, community partner support. We've also used that funding um, to hire 10 temporary staff to assist with our uh, vaccine and testing clinics. And then the final slide on the horizon. Um, we are continuing to monitor the state as a uh, leader in monitoring uh, variants, COVID variants, and we, we have this uh, Greek alphabet at the bottom of the slide because the World Health Organization has renamed the COVID variants to avoid stigmatizing countries where a new strain has emerged and also get us away from those all those numbers that we are having to try and remember. So Alpha has been assigned to the variant that was first uh, discovered in the United Kingdom. And that is a very prevalent uh, strain variant here in Minnesota. Minnesota, the Alpha variant accounts for up to 70% of all of our COVID cases now. Um, although we have also identified um, some of the additional uh, variants in Minnesota as well. Luckily, vaccines have been shown to be effective against all of the uh, variants, at least in uh, preventing severe disease and death. On the horizon, we also continue to work with community partners on vaccinating at-risk groups, which, which will require more and more imagination, and so would welcome any ideas that you have or that you want to send our way in terms of ways to reach out to communities that might not have been reached as yet. And then we're also uh, working to right-size our response as the community need changes. And that's my report. Uh, stand for questions if there are any, Mr. Chair. Great, thank you, Commissioner. Very informative and, and appreciate these updates. Um, I like the updated way of being able to identify the variants. That's uh, much appreciated. All right, so I will pause to see if there are any questions or comments from my colleagues related to this presentation. Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Cunningham, and thank you, Commissioner Musicant, uh, for this presentation. I do think that there's a little potential for confusion, and I guess I wanted to hear kind of your your thoughts on, you know, I, there, it's tough to get an apples to apples comparison, and you noted you noted the data challenges in the different ways that reporting happens, uh, and the different sort of slices of the population that we might be measuring when we talk about a a, a particular statistic. But I I feel like you know, we had targets around lifting the mask mandate, for example, um, and now we're talking in numbers that are significantly under those targets, and I understand they're measuring different things, but I, I, I guess I just want to uh, check in with you that the that we that we are still and have sort of met the reasonable targets for lifting the mask mandate that 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 we're on uh, a kind of defensible ethical policy ground. Uh, you know, for the way we're proceeding there, that uh, the things haven't changed because I think the different numbers cause confusion, right? Based on sort of what we announced uh, uh, when the mayor announced the policy change a couple weeks ago. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, Council Member Fletcher, um, I agree, and and I use those very apples to apples words myself um, today as as uh, I was talking with staff about preparing this presentation, and I. Uh, it does take uh, some additional computation on our part, and um, there are some difficulties in um, reporting on every zip code because some of them fall out, partially fall outside the city, and I, I won't get into all that, but I think that uh, you are right in that we should, at least for those five zip codes that we focused on, um, continue to provide you information in ways that that we can look at, you know, the decision we made with the mayor um, and and where we are proceeding um, 
how we have proceeded from there. So uh, take that to heart and um, we'll work with staff to make sure that we're able to share information with you in a way that you can um, make make some sense of it, even though we have these other uh, challenges with the data because we're at that end of the census. You know, it's been 10 years since the last census. We haven't gotten the new census data. That affects our denominators. Um, so when we try and look at things by age and race, that's very difficult uh, at the zip code level with the kind of data that we have. Um, so yes, but all that aside, um, we will try and continue to report to you, at least for those five zip codes, some comparative data that, that makes sense. So thank you. Thank you, and then if I can, follow up with one other question. Um, so we we know that people of color are disproportionately not vaccinated at this point. And you mentioned that hospitalizations and or new cases, I guess, uh, was the data that you presented that said uh, people are three times more likely uh, to be showing a new case if they're not vaccinated. So can we infer from that that people of color are disproportionately uh, showing up with cases at this point that in, in terms of the impact of the way this this is playing out. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Councilmember Fletcher, I think that inference would be um, a good one. Uh, and I'm going to be trying to work with my staff, imagine with my staff how we can create messaging that might bring something that feels invisible um, to communities without making them feel stigmatized or, um, you know, uh, set apart for, for inappropriate reasons. But I do know that uh, when the outbreak began, heard from a number of people in the Somali community who were desperate for information that would help them show the community that this was something that they should take seriously. And of course, we all know it's by now, um, and I think that's widespread, but as we think about vaccinations, this information about the incidence of cases might be something that would be helpful at the community level if we could figure out a way that um, we can convey that information in a supportive way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I'm glad to hear that you've got uh, even belated resources uh, starting to come into this and just want to voice my continued support for making sure that absolutely everybody gets access to the health care uh, that we want them to have uh, in this community so that everybody can be safe. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Fletcher. Um, I want to also add my gratitude for the work that you all have been doing. I know that each each time you give a presentation, I uh, try to love on y'all a bit because I know that you've been working very, very hard. Um, many hours per week uh, since the beginning, even be before things really picked up with the pandemic. Um, and so I, as we started having conversations, as soon as things started emerging in the first place and just really fantastic work. Um, one of the things that I find uh, just, you know, as a Northside Council member, so, you know, in the zip code uh, 55411, there were overlapping dots, like there, there have been a lot of clinics, right? And um, with, a, with a few over in 55412, which is my ward, um, you know, I, I've been talking to a lot of constituents um, over the last few months and I mean, there's there's a pretty clear, like when I have conversations around the vaccine and whether or not folks are getting tested, um, I just like, I've talked to lots of black folks who are like, nope, not getting vaccinated. Like, I can't even have a conversation with them. And when I ask them why, it's like, they don't know what that vaccine's gonna do. And like, you know, so it's like, there's, there's, I, I recently spoke um, at a vaccine clinic actually um, over at uh, North Point. Um, you know, we we had a bit of a community event and, you know, just like having to recognize that there is so much trauma. I know that you all like even have a trauma related statement, you know, 
Um, I, I, I guess it's, I, I don't really have a question. It's just more to like, I'm seeing this and, and, I, and I also see the efforts that you all are putting in, in terms of having vaccine clinics. Um, I've, I've been thinking, and I know that you all have as well about like, how do we move through uh, this trauma while also holding the fact that um, the trauma is valid, right? Like, and and the experience of it is valid. And um, yeah, I mean, like, I think that that was just something that I knew, but still was taken a little bit aback by like, like there, there was nothing. Um, and actually uh, I was walking along Broadway and um, there were people who were handing out flyers that said in big letters, don't get vaccinated. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it, it says like, it, it was fairly conspiratorial of, you know, like this is meant to kill black people and, you know, or don't use your children as guinea pigs, don't get your children vaccinated. Um, and so like I got, like I pretended, you know, just walking down the street um, and got one of the flyers and was just like, oh no. Um, and uh, because it's just, it's so much easier to believe misinformation about this because of so much harm that has been done. It's easier to believe that than know something good is happening and like we're trying to actually do something good. Um, and so I just, I, I wanted to say, like, I saw the overlapping dots. I saw the amount of work that's being done um, and recognizing that it is, uh, it, we always knew it, but it was going to be a challenge to be able to, to break through um, the kind of trauma and misinformation that's in the Black community around the medical establishment. Um, and so I uh, just want to recognize that and recognize you all for the efforts and um, you know, continue to stand ready and partner in whatever ways that I can so that we can continue to try to move through it um, as we navigate not the end of this pandemic, but the new chapter of this pandemic. So uh, so thank you for all of all of what you've done. Thank you, Councilmember Cunningham. If you still have that flyer, that might be helpful as we have speakers on um, different radio shows, you know, they might be able to touch on the fact that this is information that's in the community. And as I spoke about trying to figure out how to share some of the heightened incidents that is occurring amongst unvaccinated, we know as human beings that we are always measuring risk and reward. And and I think trauma plays into that, but um, so does information about, you know, what other kinds of risks might be. And then thirdly, Really, your narrative just now talks to me about how important trusted messengers are and really reaching as many different uh, people who are are in touch with others in the community uh, so that they can share their personal experience with having been vaccinated or other information that, that might be relevant. Yes, Black Nurses Rock and what is it? The Black uh, Physician Association of Black Physicians have been really amazing over our, over here. So uh, so thank you for that. And I I didn't think to save it because I was so like I just saw it and I literally walked and took it straight to the <laughs> recycling when I got home um, as like a cleansing my palate. So uh, so that's a, my apologies, but I am happy to see if I can find the information from the website that was included on on the flyer. So uh, so thank you for that. Appreciate it. Are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? All right, I'm not seeing any. Thank you again, Commissioner. Um, I with that, I will direct the Clerk to please receive and file that report. Next up uh, for our um, item number three, uh, we have receiving and filing a presentation of the Minneapolis Police Department's uh, 2021 overtime usage and forecast for the remaining 
for the remaining year. And then uh, the second part of that will be a passage of resolution appropriating funds for the 2020, 20, 2021 um, from the police staffing, uh, sorry, public safety staffing reserve. Um, so I believe that Chief Arredondo is here today uh, to give this presentation. Welcome, Chief. Good afternoon, Chair Cunningham and committee members. All right, we will uh, thank you so much for, uh, for having us and we'll jump right into the presentation. First, yeah. So the purpose is to show overtime to date for regular operations, uh, overtime for operation safety net, and anticipated overtime for regular operations for the remainder of 2021. Uh, the additional overtime of $5 million was requested in the 2021 budget process. Uh, calculations are based on the capacity reduction due to fewer FTEs as a result of significant separations from disability leaves. Uh, this request did not include overtime estimates for protests, civil unrest, uh, the recent operation safety net, or other large scale events. Uh, the amount was placed in a reserve by council during the budget process, and MPD estimates the full amount of the reserve at $5 million will be needed to meet the overtime demands in 2021. Uh, the financial and operational challenges, uh, unlike the separations, those on leave are still employed by MPD, but not active and are paid based on sick, vacation and comp balances. Uh, burnout and wellness concerns uh, are certainly a, a very much an important consideration with any excess in overtime and the need for overtime strategies to maximize resources, um, as well as the impacts of the easing of the pandemic restrictions. Next slide. So for an hour's comparison, uh, the total 2021 regular hours without leave or overtime uh, have decreased within the MPD by 149,000 hours for the same time period in 2020. That equates to a reduction of approximately 220 FTEs or a 22% decrease in our regular hours worked in 2020. Uh, that annualized MPD projects a decrease in regular hours of 387,000 hours in 2020. Uh, the overtime cost to fill 387,000 hours is approximately $30 million. And so $5 million will fill approximately 16.6% of the capacity loss. Next slide, please. Uh, I'm sorry, back one slide. Thank you. So I just wanted to, this is Robin McPherson, and I just wanted to go over the projected overtime costs for the year. Uh, the MPD overtime for regular operations through 522, which is the last uh, payroll cycle, has was $2.3 million. Operation safety net overtime for wages was $2.9 million. So total through 522, we have spent $5.2 million. Um, out of that, we're estimating for the rest of the year, uh, and I broke this down into two separate line items. Um, summertime overtime, we expect to be $2.8 million. That's through September. And then the estimated fourth quarter, we estimate to be $1.5 million. And you'll see in a later slide, uh, kind of where those numbers came from, but briefly what our overtime looks like in any given year is a hill shaped. So the beginning of the year we start out uh, and then towards the summer months, May through September, a little bit into October, we see it rise and peak and then it starts coming down in October and through the fourth quarter to be more similar to the first quarter. Uh, the MPD budget that was approved for the 2021 budget process is $3.5 million. The overtime reserve was set up at that same time for $5 million. So between the two, we expect a deficit in uh, cost there of a million dollars. And something that came up uh, 
yesterday and was also included in this information was we do expect salary savings. Uh, there is a decrease higher. The, the number of FTEs is uh, lower than we expected during the budget process. And so we do expect a decrease in uh, salary costs of approximately $7 million. However, that will be taken up partly by additional operation safety net costs and an additional uh, estimated approximately $2 million for the COVID leave that was given to the uh, first responders if they're not using it for COVID sick leave. So that amount was not budgeted as well. So we anticipate by the time all is said and done that our payroll costs will come in something between one to $3 million to the good. Any questions about that before we continue? I'm not seeing any, please continue. Thank you. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, Council Member Fletcher. Thank you, uh, Chair Cunningham. Uh, you know, uh, I guess I'm wondering about comparing to quarter four to quarter one, uh, because quarter one was probably a low point in terms of staffing level, right? In terms of because we've we funded training classes uh, for this year that should be online uh, in in October, November, December. So I guess I'm wondering about you know, how are you factoring that into th these projections? Because uh, I, I imagine the staffing curve is actually ramping uh, up uh, from from quarter one to quarter four. Uh, and then I'm also curious, I know that two of the programs that we funded are coming online uh, in the next several weeks in terms of uh, uh, staffing only calls and mental health response calls uh, that should reduce some of the 911 uh, call volume that gets into MPD's queue. And so I guess I'm wondering how that's getting factored into these estimates as well. Sure, sure, Councilmember Cunningham and uh, or Chair Cunningham, Council Member Fletcher. Good questions. Um, regarding the first quarter to the fifth quarter, we had a class that started in February of 19 that just graduated. They're currently on the street during doing the FTO uh, portion of the training. Um, and so while they are on the street and certainly provide some service, they're still working hand in hand with a, a, another officer. And so they're not, they're not yet fully up to speed. Um, additionally, I'd love to be able to say, I really would love to be able to say that our leaves have uh, decreased and they have, but they haven't stopped. So I think that we're still seeing some happen and, um, you know, I'm hoping that they will stop, but the, the fact of the matter is they are not. And so I don't really think that we can rely on that uh, until we see a, a real stability here. Um, the other thing that if, with the other two classes, the classes starting in August actually won't graduate until the end of, towards the end of the year. And then the third class doesn't start until December. So we won't see any savings from those two classes really at all during the current year. So uh, regarding the two programs that are coming on board, I think those are great points too. Unfortunately, we really don't have any history and I think like a lot of programs, it'll probably take a little bit of time to ramp up. Um, hopefully not as much time, you know, but there will be some, some ramping into that. Uh, certainly, I look at this on a monthly basis and I'm continually forecasting. And once I see that there is an impact and what if I can, you know, one data point, I've said this before, one data point doesn't make a trend, but as soon as we can see what is what that actually is going to look like, we'll certainly revise our budget accordingly or revise our forecast accordingly. Great, thank you. Um, my other question, I guess, was uh, I know the 3.5 was what we budgeted for sort of field overtime. Uh, but it was not the entire overtime budget, right? There was a, uh, an additional close to 1.5 that was for training um, or or for other purposes. I remember that there was there was a total of close to $5 million of, of overtime uh, in, in the budget. So I guess I'm, and then I know that there's other forms of overtime that are not paid for out of our budget, right? So we have a significant buyback activity, for example, 
uh, with the downtown council and the Vikings and the Twins and Timberwolves and everybody. So uh, I, I, uh, I'm, I, I guess I'm wondering, do we do we have those totals to kind of know the 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 real total overall picture of of what kind of overtime are we are we doing in in total? So I do not have that information with me, but I'd be happy to get that for you. Our true overtime in the general fund is 3.5 million. That 1.5 was additional salaries was not overtime. So uh, we do have overtime in our non-general funds, which are primarily for buyback for grant funded items. And those, as you, as you probably know, uh, what the revenue that comes in is the expense that goes out. They, they, they offset each other. So the reserve that was placed in here was, was strictly for the general fund. Yeah, no, I under I, I understand that. I think there's sort of two considerations as we're thinking about uh, you know use of overtime in this uh, in this conversation. One is money, uh, but the other is officer wellness and capacity uh, to actually do the work. And so we do want to, uh, knowing that we've got to reduce force. I think I'm going to have some questions later on as we get further into the presentation about um, you know how much how much overtime can we realistically do with the diminished. Uh, workforce that we have right now and and uh, how much can we lean on that as a solution so um it'll be helpful to have that whole big picture to the extent that we can thanks okay. thank you uh next slide please so i'm i'm not going to spend a lot of time on this this is something that um i know we've talked about a little bit before but you know we we look at we we do a, a projection or forecast on a monthly basis on where we are as far as FTEs are concerned. And so I just wanted to throw this in um, just as more informational than anything else. But as we've said before, when somebody separates, normally we'll see a decrease in, in salary and we'll see a corresponding increase in overtime, especially when we have a group of people who are separating at the same time. Uh, it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correspondence, but there is an offset. But unfortunately, with leaves, that's not how it works. The leave, the people who are on leave are still drawing a salary, and so they're still on our books as an individual. So when I'm looking at the actual forecast of FTEs, I start with the current balance from the month before. I project a regular projection or a regular attrition, which is usually around 44, 40 to 44 a year. And then I'm also putting in the attrition from the people who are on leave. And that comes up with um, the actual number of people that we're paying. And then uh, from that number, I take away the number of people who are currently on leave to come up with a number who are actually active. And so in the case of June, we're projecting uh, an end, end of month balance of approximately 627 people. One of the things since probably fall of last year, we've had a very, very difficult time uh, forecasting this number. And fortunately, I will say that while we're still seeing people sign up for leaves or go out on, on uh, duty disability leaves, the last two months we've had a much easier time forecasting and we've, we're, we've been pretty much right on. So I do see a lot of positivity of from the last couple of months that things are slowing down and that we are getting more onto a path of stability, which I think we're all quite grateful for. So next slide, please. So this is just a visualization showing the number of FTEs that we have from last year to this year uh, over the time period, January through May. And as you can see, the um, the difference is right around 220, which is the average between the two years. Uh, the five million dollars in overtime will cover approximately 64,000 hours uh, of of time, 64,000 hours of lost capacity. Um, and again, we know that from an officer wellness standpoint, as well as the cost, it's not feasible to to do 100% of the overtime. That's just not even in the realm of possibility, unfortunately, um, but these are between the two years. Any questions at all? 
Next slide, please. And uh, this slide here presents uh, our scoring MTs as of May 31st of this year compared to uh, last year. And this excludes any recruits uh, or those on leave. So uh, from a patrol standpoint, um, previous year in 2020, uh, we were looking at 544 uh, FTEs. Uh, this year at this point in time, we're looking at a reduction down to 416. Uh, for investigative, uh, for investigations, uh, last year in 2020 at this time, it was 172, and uh, currently we're looking at 116, a uh, reduction also as well in other units, and you can see on the far right-hand screen uh, what that looks like in terms of sworn FTEs compared to 2020 uh, to where we're sitting at currently uh, today. Next slide, please. If I can just pause you all right quick, um, I have uh, Council Member Fletcher followed by Council Member Ward and with questions or comments. If we could please go back to the last slide. Thank you, Chair Cunningham. Um, Chief, I wonder if you could describe what the other units uh, are as people are kind of thinking about um, uh, prioritization of uh, scarce resources. I want to uh, help people understand sort of how the staff resources we have are being allocated. Uh, Ch Chair Cunningham to um, Councilmember Fletcher. So other units could include, uh, for example, our training unit. They could in include um, 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 in internal affairs. They could in uh, include a variety of different other units. And we're uh, we've certainly uh, been. Uh, creative. Uh, we, we certainly, one of the things we, we had launched last year was a um, uh, officers to, to actually take reports uh, so that we could free up as many uh, officers as we could. And we're continuing to do that. Uh, we've collapsed, obviously, over the past year, we've collapsed and uh, 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 decommissioned units that we had had previously. So uh, we're, we're constantly continuing to uh, uh, to look at that. Some of those other units could also be backgrounds when we're in the hiring phase and 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 some of those. And so we'll continue to keep looking at uh, the organization as we uh, um, are dealing with the uh, the staffing challenges. Thank you. And we have a question or comment from, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Councilmember Fletcher, are you done? Okay, uh, I have a question or comment from Councilmember Gordon. Yeah, and I, Maybe this is slightly off topic. Um, I want to be clear, we have 60 on disability leave approximately right now. And I just want to get clarity that we haven't seen anybody returning from disability leave. So we can pretty much predict that those people will leave. And then my second question is, have we done any kind of exit interviews or analysis to understand better about why so many officers have left uh, the department? and are leaving and are going on disability first. Uh, Chair Cunningham to Councilmember Gordon. So, um, you know, I, I would say that uh, it, it's not exactly 100% that uh, every employee that has, uh, has left on a leave has not come back. Um, I don't think that the numbers are, uh, at least at this point, really significant uh, that we fold them into. But but there's also, I should say, I believe HR um, has uh, tried to capture some information. Uh, obviously, it's not mandated by employees to uh, provide a exit interview, but I do believe um, HR has attempted to try to capture some of that um, um, information during those um, exit interviews. Yeah. Have they shared what their any findings with you at this point? Uh, Chair Cunningham to Councilmember Gordon, I have not had any, uh, received any feedback or information yet on that. Yeah. And I'm not sure if um, Ms. McPherson knows of the, the number who, who have gone on disability leave and returned to work. Last time I think we talked, it, it was pretty close to 1% um, or 0%. So I'd be curious to hear if there's more who are returning. Sure, my understanding is that we've had one and maybe two that have returned in total. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Looks like we have a follow-up question or comment from Councilmember Fletcher. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm I am wondering 
are we able to cover the gap in investigations with overtime or is that more specialized and and harder to bring people in on it? It, it feels like that's something that we'd like to see. Um, you know, strong, strong follow up on violent crime that is happening. And, uh, you know, I think that investigations function is uh, critical and uh, I'm curious if that's something that overtime addresses or is overtime really addressing the gap in patrol more than anything. Uh, Councilmember Fletcher, um, regarding investigations, I did a really quick recap um, for the year, and it looks like our investigations does use a significant amount of overtime, first of all. And I, I think the number is about $1 for every $3 in between patrol and investigations. It's just slightly under $3. So with the number of people, uh, I think that's actually pretty high. Um, so it is being used in investigations quite a bit. Thank you. And I would like to be able to uh, ask a follow up question as well. Um, Chief, could you. Um, when you talk about patrols, what does that include? Um, I, I, if you could talk about kind of like what the work is of patrol, I think that that would be helpful. Uh, yeah, Chair Cunningham. Yeah, so right now, p patrol for the most part, I, I would say, is is really that 911 responder. So of the of the five precincts, um, the three shifts, uh, these are our uh, officers really just focused on uh, responding uh, to uh, 911 calls. Um, we um, we've collapsed our community response teams are really operating now just in two out of the five precincts. Um, we, we no longer have uh, uh, foot beats or, or neighborhood beats anymore, but really our, our patrol is is pretty much, uh, when you look at the numbers there on the uh, screen, that's pretty much uh, 911 response calls. Yeah. And I'm curious about, sorry, I'm hearing a little bit of an echo there, but um, I'm curious about the, amount of time that is being used for um, when when we have officers that are showing up on scene and having to do an investigation right then and there. Um, I'm curious because, you know, it's like they do the initial evidence gathering, right? So it's like they get the shell casings, they ask questions. So I'm curious, um, like are where are we seeing a lot of time being spent for patrols? You know, like, is it folks calling in and, and asking, you know, like, what, what are we seeing a lot of time being spent for patrols? Uh, uh, Chair Cunningham, that is a great question. I'm going to turn it over to our Patrol Bureau Chief, uh, DC Fours. Thank you. Welcome, DC Fours. Good afternoon, council member. Thank you for the question. Um, as the chief highlighted, uh, there's a lot of different things that um, obviously our patrol bureau is responding to. And uh, and one of the things that you hit upon um, is something that we have looked into in the past, and that is the, the significant number of resources it takes to respond to a complex scenes such as shootings and homicides. And uh, with um, the increase of gunshot wound victims that we've had, um, and currently, based upon my last data, we're at uh, 259 gunshot wound victims versus of where we were at last year of 116. Um, that's uh, 139 uh, more individual victims. Um, each one of these shootings, uh, when we've extrapolated out last year and did a little bit deeper dive, um, generally, when we looked at it in 2020, one individual shooting utilized just over uh, police, uh, 10 police units. Uh, at its peak resource demand, and that's usually with the, within the first 30 to 45 minutes. Um, these calls do take an awful lot of resources to respond to, and that and that uh, hampers our ability to respond to other calls for service. Similarly, homicides do the same thing. Uh, we're at 38 versus 21. That's an 81% increase. Um, these these scenes, and, and rightly so, uh, need to have the proper response to them. And so, a lot of our resource demand is going to uh, some of our more uh, at least the most um, 
important and, and, and serious incidents that we're responding to. Does that help? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, you know, that's that's kind of what I was thinking was the case, because, um, you know, in, in other cities when things are a little bit slower, a lot of times, you know, police officers are, it's like neighbors are going at it, you know, a neighbor dispute and they go and like facilitate it. You know, I figure that a majority of the time is actually being spent on more serious crimes and, and really having to do the initial investigations. Um, you know, I one of the uh, an interesting case study that I read was around um, Houston Police Department when they did investigative first responders um, where they had like a unit that went out to specific like not just a unit, but like, well, sort of like a team of folks who went to those sort of initial um, investigations um, and uh, and it was it was very successful and it actually freed up. Uh, detectives doing investigations like follow-up investigations to be able to do other strategies um, and so I just you know just wanted to throw that out there as, as a potential example to be able to help alleviate a little bit I don't know I'm, I'm not a police officer but it's just a case study that I saw that I wanted to throw out there um, the uh, Houston's uh, investigative first responders uh, they did a pilot the reason why I didn't stick is because officers refused to <laughs> make it permanent so that might be a good lesson learned, but um, but the results of that were very positive um, and, and did help to take up alleviate some pressure. I, I'm assuming you probably maybe are familiar with it. You know, it oh, yeah, there's there's a various forms of that. Just so, just so you know, for for at least my uh, experience and my time in the in the MPD, we do have um, on duty. We, we rotate them in on duty uh, investigative response car. Uh, that that goes out and responds to all serious incidents when they happen solely for the, the purpose of what you're saying is that they can go out and do that initial scene response, help collect evidence, help manage things, and thereby, I would say, get the best jump on that the forensic response and coordinating with people. But they don't necessarily have to own the case. They're just there to provide that immediate on the phone call uh, response of two detectives that will come out and, and help uh, manage the crime scene. And we do find great value in that uh, to, to be able to get that on the scene um, experience and guidance and leadership. So thank you great. for that information. Yeah, no, great. Glad to hear it. All right. Uh, I don't see any other questions or comments, so um, I will pass it back to, I think it's Director McPherson. Yes, please. Next, thank you for the slide. Um, just a, a couple of things. Again, this is just more of a visualization of our payroll on a monthly basis. You can see the regular pay has remained uh, low um, in our overtime, a little bit higher compared to last year, which you don't see on here. But our, as you can see, our overtime is going up gradually as we reach the summer months. Um, I also wanted to give Councilmember Fletcher had asked some questions about officer wellness and some of our other forms of overtime that our officers are, are using. And I wanted to give a little bit of information on that. Um, we have probably, well, this year is, and last year for that matter, has been slightly different because of COVID. And a lot of the buyback that we had in prior years uh, is not even available uh, like it had been in the past. Uh, when things open up or as things have opened up, we may see that rise during the summer. So that will definitely be something that we'll need to keep an eye on. From a federal standpoint and from a grant and task force standpoint, anything that is uh, federal task force related, whether it's a, a short term task force for a particular court case or a longer term task force, there's maximums that an officer can earn and that's all over time. That averages, if you're look, looking at it as strictly an average, that averages about four to five hours a week. Uh, it's actually not a lot that they can earn um, over a period of a year. Uh, and again, then the buyback, we've seen a lot less this year than we have in the past. Any questions about this slide before I go on? We have a question from Council Member Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Cunningham. I think that brings up an important point about federal task forces and and really kind of understanding. Uh, I know one of the ways that uh, Chief Arredondo and the mayor have uh, spoken in press briefings about uh, addressing the staffing shortage is around asking for uh, federal support. Uh, and so we know that there are there are federal task forces and and federal 
agencies operating uh, in some cases with our invitation as a way of uh, providing support. And then also I, I think people have been asking questions about how often we're detailing people to federal task forces or, or uh, participating in, in those kinds of arrangements. So I, 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 I do wonder what you can share with us about uh, what federal agencies are operating right now in the city of Minneapolis, of what roles they're playing and what roles MPD is playing with them. So I'm going to go ahead and defer that to the chief in DC force. Chair Cunningham to Council Member Fletcher. Uh, so thank you for your question. So we we certainly have had a relationship with our federal uh, partners uh, outstanding for, for many decades. Um, we currently, as you may recall, um, last year with the uptick in carjackings and, and some of our shootings, um, we uh, have asked for assistance with our uh, local, AT, local ATF, um, uh, our FBI, uh, U.S. Attorney's Office as well. Some of that is is, is based on prosecution uh, assistance they can provide us with, but also um, they have teams out there that can help focus on those individuals who are bringing in guns to our community, harming our community, and and uh, can can focus on them. Um, so we uh, and I should also say they are also able to bring in assets to help us with uh, uh, evidence, uh, shell casings, and being able to. Um, uh, track those and, and and catalog those so that we can have successful cases ultimately apprehending folks and then and then successful charging um we are really limited in terms of in terms of task force specifically um we do have uh, some officers assisting in investigative role with uh, atf and i and i uh, don't know that the numbers would have to be very minimal because we just uh, don't have a whole lot of uh, uh, resources right now to participate in those. Um, any sorts of, of, of our, any of our employees that are participating in any sort of uh, task force, they're still bound by our policies, our, our rules, procedures, regulations. Um, and so uh, whether that's body worn cameras or use of force, you name it. And so, um, but um, yeah, clearly we, we do continue to rely upon our uh, federal agencies assistance to help us, uh, uh, whether it's again, technology, um, intelligence um, and uh, uh, helping to have more bodies out there to help us apprehend those who would be ha causing harm in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I would I like to ask a follow-up question. question. Um, so I would, so say, I would say the, the question, I'm sorry, I'm there's sorry, an there's echo there's happening, so my apologies. I don't know where that's coming from, but um, so you had talked about um, intelligence gathering. So I, I and I understand that there's a, a difficulty for MPD to be able to participate because of lack of capacity. I'm curious though, um, how is that intelligence uh, being fed into MPD? Because like, you know, so what I'm thinking is like, I would really hope that the ATF would be able to help us figure out who's bringing the guns into the city, right? And then it's like, if we're able to know who's bringing in the guns into the city, then that helps us with being able to know that who's selling them on the ground, right? And so then that is targeted enforcement. So, you know, um, so like there's that. And I guess, you know, like my question also is like under the other units, like is that like where the intelligence gathering is happening? Um, because so that we're able to direct our resources in the most targeted, impactful ways. Uh, where does intelligence fit into this and how are we able to connect? Are we able to, because, you know, the feds are doing their own thing. So, like, are we able to connect that intelligence that we're gathering? Um, and what kind of capacity are we looking at for intelligence within um, our current staffing? You're muted, Chief. Sorry about that, Chair Cunningham. That is a great question about how our federal agencies interact with us, specifically related to intelligence, and then what are some of the results of that? I'm going to have Deputy Chief Fors uh, walk you through that. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, uh, in response, uh, uh, Councilmember Cunningham, to your question about our our our. our I would say information sharing and our interoperability, but specifically with the ATF, uh, they've been tremendous partners with us. Uh, they provided us not only with uh, boots on the ground resources, but a, a definitely a, a, a commitment and a willingness to partner with us 
and and provide on scene response and and their uh, their agents work shoulder to shoulder with our officers, both in the capacity of helping to generate intel and that sharing of intelligence, but also. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's a multi layered approach, and I know you're you're discussing things such as you know targeted and making sure you're focused on the right things, such as and and that's a that's a multitude of things because it could be um, you want to be focused on on the people out there doing the most damage. So you want to be focused on, on the, the human aspect of identifying people who are most at risk of either becoming victims of violence or committing violence. Um, you want to use your technology, and that's where the, the ATF and, and with, with the NIBIN system and, and our ability to, to process the evidence that we recover at scenes in a very short turnaround and be able to link that evidence to other crime scenes. Um, so that that gun crime intelligence is what we talk about, where you can track a specific firearm into different areas and different times and utilizing that level of intelligence. Uh, and then there's also the the gun purchasing intelligence, as you spoke of, and that's where the federal partnerships come in extraordinarily well because of their ability through federal firearms licenses to track things. And we do uh, identify through our cooperative uh, networks, uh, the so-called straw purchasers, who are out there buying large numbers of guns that you know mysteriously turn up involved in crimes, uh, and we've been very successful in getting people uh, charged as straw purchasers in that regard. They also, um, in terms of intel sharing, uh, come to, you know, to our shooting review meetings and, and participate with our detectives where in that human aspect, we sit down and we break down every individual shooting um, and and see you know who has information. Is it about you know person, place, or time? Is it about, you know, what is what, where's the where's the metric we need to be focusing on? We also share that with the county. Um, so there's a there's an awful lot of of kind of organic information sharing going on. Um, and the and as we've been facing some of the the our greatest difficulties with uh, with gunshot wound victims and shootings and violence, um, the ATF is has really stepped up uh, in terms of providing us with whatever resources we need and working within us. And 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 and, and as I know, there, there's a lot of focus on body-worn camera issues uh, and different things. And this is the reason why we 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 stopped participating in certain task forces some time ago. Um, our officers uh, do not want to be operating out there without body-worn cameras, and we do not want them operating out there without body-worn cameras. And I think the public and, and everyone expects that people are going to be operating with their body-worn cameras. So uh, rest assured that is continuing. Great, thank you for that. Um, we're, we're talking a lot about sworn officers, um, sworn personnel. I'm curious about um, what are things looking like from like the crime analyst side of things? Again, kind of taking this intelligence and being able to be um, as targeted as possible, like crime analysts play a really critical role. Um, and so I'm curious about civilian um, personnel and, and what, how, if at all, they're being impacted um, right now and, and what their role is looking like in the allocation of our current resources. Council Member Cunningham, thank you for the question. Um, obviously, we, we did lose uh, some personnel and then with uh, budgetary hiring freeze that, that did impact some. We are hiring and we believe we hired one and we're in the process of hiring uh, two additional. Um, so that is going to be a great help uh, in terms of having that analytical capacity coming back online. Uh, and it's because it, as and you are very much correct in the sense that um, the more analysts, the better. Uh, they can get us focused in the right direction and on the right path uh, and can free up uh, some sworn to do some other tasks. Uh, and uh, they're definitely specially trained and, and depending upon what task they're put on um, can, uh, can be a, a, I would say, a multiplier for us. So yes, we are, we are hiring, we are increasing our capacity and we look forward to them coming uh, into full uh, full participation. Great, thank Great. you. I, ju I just think that it's, you know, and, and I'm glad to hear that reflected back, you know, that crime analysts are a really important part of the work because really they do help us be able to make as smart strategic decisions as possible about how to allocate our resources, particularly when they are as limited as they are right now. So uh, thank you for that. And um, I, yes, please. 
Councilmember Cunningham, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, okay. but I wanted to add just a little bit to that too. Um, our civilian overtime has actually decreased from last year to this year. I think a lot of that has to do with COVID. One area, however, that it has hit hard is a crime lab, which has increased their overtime pretty significantly because of the crime that's going on right now in the city. So that is the anomaly, I think, amongst the, the civilians themselves. Uh, one of the things that we've been trying to do over the last I don't know, five years or so is gradually increase and civilianize some of the positions. I feel that that's really important and even more important than it was five or six years ago when we started this process. But we really need to bring in people who have the experience, the education, um, the background to do some of these jobs and let the law enforcement officers do what they do best. Um, and so that that is something that we will continue to work on, you know, over the coming years. So. Great, thank you so much. I have not seen any other questions or comments from my colleagues, so uh, back to you. Next slide, please. And um, I do have to say that the chief had to to uh, leave the meeting, so DC Force and I will finish this up and ask you know answer any additional questions that you may have. Uh, this is the monthly costs uh, for overtime. Again, just a visualization on, on what our overtime normally looks like during a year, and this is no different. Uh, this excludes obviously Operation Safety Net. Um, you would have seen a big spike there, obviously, in April. But we will see that continue to climb during the summer months and then come down after summer. Next slide, please. One of the things that I wanted to look at was to look at the overtime and what's the makeup of the overtime. And one of the things that's probably no surprise to any of us is that uh, the number of hours of overtime hours that are due because of staff shortage. Uh, we either need to fill a shift, we need, we have late calls, we have holdover of calls because of activity that's going or change of schedule is significantly more in 2021. It's making up almost half of overtime hours that have occurred in the first quarter um, compared to last year. It was about 25%. So um, I think that's a direct reflection of our staffing. Any questions at all before I go to the next slide? Next I'm not slide. Any. Thank you. And this is just a breakout of some of the major components of overtime. Again, you'll see a pretty significant amount because of the staff shortage, uh, case management, homicide on call, You'll see in the red, the civilian has, has decreased from last year. Court costs for overtime have decreased as well because of, of the shutdowns that have occurred. Uh, and training has decreased a little bit because outside training, uh, one, because of budgetary constraints, but also COVID. So we've seen a, a, a slight decrease in um, overtime related to any training. Next slide, please. Uh, and DC Forest is going to talk about the strategies that the department is employing at this point. Thank you, Director. As previously discussed, um, we, we, just, we uh, mentioned the need to do uh, targeted applications of the resources that we have specifically because uh, they are limited at this time. Um, that being said, when we're going to put out some overtime details, uh, they're going to be targeted. Uh, when I discuss mitigation strategies, uh, this is when specific uh, crime trends or crime problems pop up in locations. Uh, you can uh, take a, a robbery a person, for example, if there's a, a robbery trend uh, where we're seeing a pattern, a discernible pattern in a particular area uh, and, and also around time and location that uh, the inspectors are working to develop uh, some details that will mitigate that. Uh, our goal is to is to either alleviate that uh, that problem or solve the problem, and that's going to be definitely situations where we can uh, identify patterns. Uh, we can give this information to officers; so they know how to act with it. It's within a location. It's within a a, a somewhat discernible period of time. 
and we feel that putting resources in that particular space uh, with those particular uh, with that particular intelligence has got a likelihood of of addressing that. Um, we also uh, look at uh, I would say recognizable and expected areas where we need to have more presence, such as uh, bar closed areas, both in uptown and, and in downtown. Uh, we know that during certain periods of time, there's going to be a, a large influx of people on the street, and it's going to be challenging uh, to mitigate that without having some extra resources on hand. Again, that situations we can identify in advance. We know Friday, Saturday nights, certain periods of time, certain areas, and we can do our best to try to forecast out and uh, and hopefully get those uh, those positions filled on a long term basis. Joint operations, as discussed, we work uh, uh, any endeavors we may have uh, with outside agencies to also address uh, some of these crime problems. We just, there's been joint operations that have been done uh, with certain uh, agencies for crime problems that affect uh, not just us, but, but other agencies, carjackings uh, were one. Um, there's a lot of attention uh, being focused on some of the problems going on with uh, street racing and the hot rotting that uh, is a metro wide issue. Um, but th those are somewhat limited and, and we do focus most of our attention uh, into targeted uh, strategies and also our core services, uh, which is one of our last strategy and that is uh, utilizing overtime to help fill gaps in our core services and that is 911 response and uh, working to ensure that we have proper staff on hand uh, to respond to calls and, and to be there when people call 911, knowing that um, some of our, I would say our most taxing types of calls, such as shootings and homicides are, are at much higher rate and, and do require uh, higher levels of, of police response in order to, to handle correctly. DC4s, if I may just right quick, um, can you can you speak a little bit more about the mitigation strategies uh, that that are here? Yes, uh, what particularly would you like to, to discuss? Could you go back through the description a little bit of what those strategies look like? My apologies, I, I think sure. I may have. This would be things such as um, when we're doing our, our MSTAT and I'm having my individual one-on-one -on -one meetings with inspectors, these would be uh, emergent crime problems uh, that are occurring at the precinct level. And that inspectors and through also through crime analysis, we're recognizing that a specific crime trend is occurring in a specific area. And there's enough discernible information such as recognizable pattern, um, maybe uh, a, Sus enough suspect information you can you feel that there might be a, a good chance of catching whoever's doing this uh, time period uh, enough information that you can recognize it if we can dedicate uh, or get uh, a contingent of people to to focus in a certain area for a certain period you know during certain times on a specific issue armed with uh, good intel that will hopefully point them in the right direction um, those are the type of things that we want to be able to uh, expend uh, overtime for uh, at the precinct level and, and in cooperation with the inspectors. Um, I guess to put it bluntly, I don't want just people putting out people for extra patrol with no guidance and no structure. Um, I want uh, if there is a, a specific crime issue going on in a specific neighborhood and we can readily say that it's most likely occurring on Thursday, Friday and Saturday. It looks like it occurs between 10 p.m. to 2 in the morning. Uh, in this neighborhood and we're developing information as to what the the MO or the, the likely things or what information we have. Uh, when we put people out on the street with this, they have this information in their hands. I think that's a good uh, a good use of, of overtime and, and, and I would say a more focused scalpel approach to, to trying to mitigate crime issues uh, rather than just throwing people into an area with with uh, with little uh, with little guidance or just to have extra presence. So that's what I'm uh, that's what I'm uh, meaning or intending when I discuss targeted strategies. No, I really appreciate that. Um, that is something I strongly advocate for. So I'm glad 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 to get a little bit more information um, because you know having more patrols for more patrols' sake does not 
get us to where we want, want to go, which is lowering crime and violence. And so being able to be um, as strategic as possible um, with how we are allocating our resources. You know, I, I use this um, as an example and spoke to this yesterday. Uh, for example, Logan and Lowry is one of the hottest hotspots in the city. Um, and, you know, I've been layering on uh, bringing in agencies that work with women who are being sex trafficked or people who are being sex trafficked and, you know, folks who are struggling with substance abuse disorder and uh, helping the neighbors feel supported who live on that block and addressing livability issues. And it's like, but until we're able to remove the most violent offenders who are on that block that all of this activity is orbiting, it's like we're kind of chasing our tails. So like being able to like have a little support there uh, would go a really long way to being able to like actually fully implement, which essentially is a problem oriented policing project um, to try to actually solve the problems that we're having um, at Logan and Lowry rather than just temporarily like have a temporal displacement and it just happens at a different time of day or whatever, whatever. And so, um, so I, I, I really um, am, am glad to hear that, that we're leaning into intelligence and, and being uh, intentional about our resources. Um, I'm curious about, so, you know, in the mayor's um, ARP request, um, there is um, a request related to overtime for GBI. Um, I am curious as to why right now we have to look at overtime um, for that rather than someone being assigned, um, like as a part of their full time work. I'm not sure if you're the right person to ask that question. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, would, I don't have the answer for you for that uh, council member. Okay, because that's also a mitigation strategy. So that's uh, around I like think, focus I think deterrence. it's a bit too old. Of um of capacity issues too and I mean, and GVI GVI was is is a is a wonderful uh, program and I had a lot to do with that and I think it um it was about I think I think a lot of it was about you know losing the capacity to have individually dedicated people to that um and and I believe the spirit of the overtime was that we could we could train additional people to have that capacity to do the custom notifications and then through the utilization of overtime outside of the regular hours we would it would give us a pool of people that would be able to help with the uh, custom notifications I mean, outside of their regular duties and we could be a little bit more nimble with those i think that was the spirit of that got it no that's I just want to be clear that was not a setup. I was genuinely curious about the decision uh, related to that because of the fact that focus deterrence is so effective in like getting ahead of and mitigating uh, certain types of gun violence. So just wanted to to check in about that. Um, great. I will. Uh, are there any other questions or comments related to strategies that have been covered here today? All right. Not seeing yeah, any. So yeah, I'll turn yeah, it right. over. Oh. My apologies. Oh, yeah, now I see it. My apologies, Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Cunningham. I know it gets confusing because I'm putting myself in queue quite a few times. We, uh, uh, you know, we take seriously this this presentation. I want to make sure we're we're really getting the information we need. Uh, DC four is. I, I, I'm wondering if. Um, I think one of the things that's been frustrating in the conversations about police st staffing. Uh, has been that a lot of people obviously will just say, well, we're hearing there's not enough, so we want more. Why why won't you have more, right? And we know that there's uh, going to be active debate on that question, but in the meantime, it is not actually possible uh, to just hire more officers quickly, right? We have a training bottleneck and we have a recruiting bottleneck uh, that are very real, and so we are working within the reality of the staff that we have. Um, and I think the same thing is true of overtime, and so I want to check in uh, given, you know, we have the staffing level that we have, whether you uh, uh, think we should have hundreds and hundreds more or not, uh, that is what we have. And uh, there is a limited capacity to do this over time. And I think it's very important to be talking about strategic uh, work based on data, based on intelligence, uh, to be in locations and times where crime is trending. Uh, this is the right idea. Uh, I'm also hearing um, 
from at least one inspector that even when overtime is authorized, uh, where they've determined that it's needed, um, the they're not necessarily getting those shifts filled. And so I guess I'm wondering, uh, are we replacing uh, one kind of not realistic solution that, that some people uh, are asking for with another kind of not realistic solution in terms of in terms of addressing this with urgency, right? In terms of addressing this, you know, with, with right now, are we actually getting able to get shifts filled uh, where where we've determined that overtime makes sense strategically based on intelligence and data? Uh, how often are we authorizing overtime, but then not able to identify someone who's available for it? I know there have been some particular uh, uh, strains on staffing over the last couple of weeks uh, with the uh, shooting in Uptown uh, with the federal task force and every, everything else. But uh, what, uh, what, what's been the experience of getting these shifts filled where you're identifying the need? Well, quite honestly, Councilmember, there's really no easy or, or simple answer to that. Uh, it's there's two different there's two different uh, metrics. One you have, um, which is why we like to uh, specifically in regards to like downtown, uh, you know, safety endeavors or things. You'd like to be able to plan that out long in advance, um, like anything, and like you, you or anyone else, uh, people like to plan their lives. You get a much better response if you're able to forecast out long in advance that hey we're going to be having some opportunities for overtime to do these particular uh, duties. Uh, if you can put that out far far enough in advance, is a much better likelihood you're going to get these shifts filled because people can can plan their life around that. Um, where you get into difficulties is trying to fill things on short on short notice, uh, and that's just human. That's just kind of the, uh, I, I guess. Sometimes there'll be people that can and are willing uh, to drop what they're doing and come in and fill a shift, and and others you may not be able to get a hold of people, and others just may not be willing because they're 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 committed to you know other aspects of their life. Um, so that's that's the kind of the challenge is you're just dealing with uh, the emergent nature of the need, and sometimes uh, and like anything, if you if you can forecast out that need, it's much easier to get it filled than than um, unexpected need at the last minute and and then that's the case then you you, you just have to readjust and, and go on thank you yes great thank you so much back to you uh, next slide and that's actually the end of our uh, presentation um, any questions from any of the council members great Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? We've had a nice, robust conversation today, um, being able to talk about the impacts um, that we're experiencing, uh, being able to talk about the, the strategies, and then um, really about the realistic nature of how we're going to be able to, to, to what ability and what capacity to be able to fill over time. Because uh, to your point earlier, Director McPherson, as you said, um, we can't fill 100% of the overtime like that's for a multitude of reasons and so being realistic about how we're able to to reach that um council member fletcher thank you chair cunningham just uh just one kind of bigger picture question about overtime is uh i know there have been studies that show that uh officers working overtime are more likely to uh, escalate to use of force are more likely to make decisions that that lead on an escalation path and that seems to be reflected in data the uh, incidents of use of force have gone up even as our number of officers has gone down um, over the last year and so I guess I'm wondering what are we doing to make sure that as we are relying on overtime this year uh, we're continuing to create accountability. We're creating, continuing to uh, really make sure that we're enacting the de-escalation goals that the chief has set and and the uh, policies that the chief and the mayor have enacted. Um, I, I guess I just want to make sure that de-escalation is still the framework we're operating in, and 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 recognize that use of force has been uh, has you know has been higher uh, in, in the data, and that it's worth making sure that we're thinking about that. Uh, and then I have one additional question after that. Uh, 
Council member, I'll, I'll uh, attempt to answer these questions for for Director McPherson. Um, obviously, you, you, you're correct in the sense that we, we would rather not rely on overtime to fill any of these gaps. We would much rather uh, not have that. It's 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 not the, the ideal long term tool to do anything with. Um, and, and, and definitely we are still very much uh, focused on and, and moving you know, toward increases of the, the accountability for de-escalation and that really is part of our, um, our training and, and, and everything that we do uh, is focused upon that. As far as the data that you pointed out, I'm not familiar with that, so I will inquire with that with our uh, Deputy Chief of Professional Standards as to um, how, you know, if there's any, if there's an increase in, the, in, report, in reported use of force, what does that look like? You may see increases as we change the accountability of our use of force policy, such as um, now including handcuffing as reportable force, uh, include, including uh, things as, such as a, uh, an escort hold as reportable force, whereas previously we had not done so. Um, so as we're, we're uh, I would say, uh, working to increase our accountability and reporting, uh, I would say in transparency of, of, of what is force and how we're applying force, um, we got to be make sure that when we're looking at that data that we're not seeing uh, we're not seeing a blip as a result of our increased re self reporting. Uh, and if we are seeing an increase, what is it that we're what is it that we're seeing? So um, always we want to be cautious if we see patterns, we see trends. We want to look into them. If we're seeing increases because we're being uh, we're being more stringent and we're we're being better about re reporting our force, um, that might be, in in some ways, uh, not a bad thing if we're seeing better accountability. Thank you. Yeah, I actually agree that uh, if if it's because we're reporting more, um, that that would actually be a good outcome in terms of transparency. Uh, and I I I hope it's that. Um, I, I do want to make sure that it is. And so I, I would suggest that maybe that's a good topic for Commander Case to follow up on in his next regular report to us uh, in the in the cadence of uh, these public safety committee meetings. Uh, that would be a good thing for us to do a deep dive on because there is really good dashboard data um, mm -hmm. you know, a, a around use of force and and we can see sort of the top lines, but I'd be I'd be interested to hear a little more analysis on that because I know it's it's just so, so important that we take seriously that um, our sort of moral obligation to use force uh, minimally and responsibly and uh, to de-escalate as much as we possibly can. Um, thank you for that. I just want to say thank you for this presentation. This is really, you know, the intention in our uh, budget proceedings uh, back in uh, November and December was to create uh, a moment of transparency and, and to make sure that we are getting good updates on staffing. I feel like we've gotten a, a good snapshot there's a lot more uh, I would love to to press on, and I'm sure we can uh, uh, have continued conversations uh, at, at at future meetings. But this actually was a very helpful presentation. I think it was a really good conversation, and uh, I appreciate that. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, just want to um, uh, ask you to continue uh, bringing this kind of data to us. I think it's good for the public to have visibility into. Um, uh, you know, how these resources are being used. Yeah, great conversation. Um, much to Councilmember Fletcher's point, this is what we were hoping to do was to create space to be able to have a transparent conversation about, about what we're looking at here. So, so that's um, really great. Are there any other questions or comments? I also do just want to acknowledge that Councilmember Ellison has joined us today. I, Councilmember, Cunningham, if I can, I just wanted to let uh, Councilmember Fletcher know that we would pass along that request to Commander Case for his next presentation. Great, thank you for that. All right, I am not seeing any further questions or comments from my colleagues. Um, so with that, um, I will move approval of item 3.2 and ask the clerk to please call the roll. Council Member Gordon. Aye. Council Member Ellison. Aye. Council Member Cano. Council Member Palmasano. Here, one second. Aye. 
Vice Chair Fletcher. Aye. And Chair Cunningham. Aye. There are five ayes. That motion carries and will be forwarded to the full city council meeting next week. I believe it's next week, yes. Um, and our last item for discussion today, colleagues, is um, accepting a grant award from the Minnesota Department of Commerce in the amount of about $1.3 million for auto theft prevention. Um, we will also be, uh, as a part of this, 4.2 is authorizing the MPD to contract with other law enforcement agencies to act as a fiscal agent for up to $300,000 of funding um, for this particular program. Um, and then uh, also a uh, passage of a resolution approving the appropriation of the funds to the Minneapolis Police Department. So um, a couple of cycles ago, I think it was like three cycles ago at this point, we um, approved the grant uh, submittal of a grant application and now we are here accepting the grant award itself. So um, today we will be having a staff presentation by Officer Lance De DuPaul and other uh, folks from MPD. So I will turn it over to uh, Officer DuPaul to take it from here. Thank you. Actually, Chair Cunningham, uh, Deputy Chief Wait here, and I am going My to- My apologies, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> All right. No, you're fine. So I was just going to do a little brief um, introduction, if I may. Uh, the folks that are on today, it will be, like you had said, Officer DePaul and Sergeant Adams. They both work for me and um, they work for all of us. And I wanted to just highlight some little bit of information about auto thefts and also introduce them if I may. So, all right. So I am here today, of course, to discuss uh, the approval for the grant award from the Minnesota Department of Commerce and wanted to highlight some information about auto thefts. Um, back since 2014, actually, we've experienced a 155% increase in auto thefts. Just this past week alone, from June 1st through the 7th, we've experienced 86 incidents of auto theft. You know, it consistently impacts our residents and visitors more, nearly more than every other part one crime. The only other part one crime that is higher is theft from motor vehicles. So when items are taken, removed, from vehicles. Um, but citywide, our auto theft hotspots, they've really consistently existed in some of our neighborhoods that really have experienced the highest levels of poverty. Some of the neighborhoods, including Whittier, Hawthorne, and Jordan, just to name a few. Monitoring these auto thefts and placing our bait vehicles in the areas most impacted by this crime is really the key to having an impact on these crime trends. The city has received the support of funding from this grant for over the past 20 years, and the continued grant support of this program is really pivotal to, our, to the program's success. Officer Lance DePaul is with, uh, with us as well today. He has served the department for over 25 years and is assigned to the role of Auto Theft Prevention Coordinator and has worked there since the summer of 2018. In this capacity, he has played really an integral role in the success of the program and now working very closely with crime analysts. I'm glad that you had brought that up earlier. Um, that's really a, a key to the success of this program and doing that analysis of what has happened on a weekly basis to see where best to place those bait vehicles. And that collaboration that he has been involved in has really been uh, incredibly successful to this program as well. Uh, Sergeant Joe Adams, he has been with the department since 1998 and has been assigned to this crime lab now for 14 years, the past six of which he has been assigned as a supervisor. He's got significant knowledge and skill set and has had an opportunity to work throughout the crime lab, so I'm happy to introduce both of them to you today. Thank you, DC Wade. Welcome. Good afternoon, council members. I'm Officer Lance DuPaul. Uh, I'm going to jump right into this uh, PowerPoint presentation I have here, um, which will discuss what the Minnesota Auto Theft Prevention Grant is and what we are awarded and what the MPD Auto Theft Prevention Unit is at a, as a whole. Uh, feel free, free to ask me any questions that you have as we go, or I'll take some questions at the end. 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is not a new grant for us. Uh, this is a continuation of a state grant that we've been part of since 1997. Uh, this grant was started only in 1996, and so we are one of the original um, partners uh, with the state on auto theft prevention. Uh, this current grant cycle will run from July of 2021 through the end of June of 2023. Uh, during this grant cycle, we're going to focus on the traditional auto thefts, um, plus the increase of robberies resulting in carjackings and the catalytic converter thefts that are occurring. Uh, the first part of this grant is dealing with the funding of the auto theft prevention unit, um, which covers personnel costs, training, uh, bait vehicle equipment, maintenance, our garage lease, and, exp and expenses uh, running a bait vehicle fleet. Um, the second uh, funding portion is for the MPD forensic unit uh, to aid our, our robbery investigators investigating carjackings. Um, the computer forensic unit has received funding for new device examination software. Uh, having this software is going to allow them to examine devices in-house and not have to send them over to the BCA for examination, and which can cause uh, investigations to stall out. Um, with this in-house investigations, uh, we are going to have a faster resolution to cases and move them forward. Um, the additional funding also is there for their technicians to, re to, re to receive their certifications that they need uh, to keep the unit as a national certification. Uh, the software, just a side note, the software that they're going to, that they're looking to purchase is only used when there is a court order to examine a device. And that device has to be related to a crime and it has to spell out specifically what data they are looking for on that device. Uh, we also will be able to use this uh, software on all our other investigations, uh, not just carjackings. The other additional funding for the forensic unit is for the uh, forensic scientists at the crime lab at, or at the forensic garage to actually process vehicles. Um, they've been inundated with requests to process vehicles with the increase of auto thefts and carjackings um, and catalytic converter thefts. So we're looking to be able to add some funds for them to be able to process vehicles related to auto theft investigations. Um, again, keeping investigations on track. Uh, and once again, these requests have to be done with a court order, just like uh, a, a mobile device. It will be, you know, searching for specific things related to that crime. And the final part of the grant award is for MPD to be a fiscal administrator of an overtime fund that all departments that are part of the state grant can access. These funds are for, are for related are auto theft related investigations that arise during the grant period. Um, MPD has been able to access, will be able to access this overtime fund if needed in an investigation. It is important that all departments have uh, access to ongoing funding as an investigation can affect several different jurisdictions. Uh, next slide. Uh, this graph is just showing you from the first of the year to the 31st of each year, the increase in auto theft. Uh, as you can see for 2021, we're slightly down from the 2020 trend, but the, but the 2020 trend was a 45% increase from uh, 2019. Carjackings this year are up at 207%. Uh, we are we are in pace for just another year of high auto theft related crimes. Next slide. Uh, in 2020, there was 4,280 vehicles stolen in Minneapolis with a value of close to $32 million. Uh, although those vehicles are recovered, more than half are significantly damaged. Uh, the economic impact on automobile theft is substantial. Uh, insurance companies do cover the cost to some, but those, those 
are passed on to consumers with higher premiums. Uh, the national auto, the national estimate is that stolen vehicles is more than 40% more likely to be involved in a crash. Uh, it causes significant damage, obviously, to the stolen vehicle, but other property and even uh, personal injuries. Automobile, automobile thefts disproportionately affect our lower income and minority communities. It's reflected in our MSTAT data. The loss of vehicles can be devastating to owners and their families. Often, they do not uh, have the funds to replace a vehicle that has been stolen, and that can have a rippling effect and uh, hardship for the for their work and for their family lives. There is when a vehicle is recovered, and if it is damaged, sometimes they don't have the funds to repair it, and they choose to still drive it, uh, and can cause unsafe operations for everyone on the roads. Um, just to, across the board in 2020, there's been an increase in auto theft in every precinct, uh, or you know, the only one precinct that has had a small decline is the first precinct or downtown. But the second precinct, Northeast Minneapolis, has had a 53, almost a 54% increase. The third precinct, which is South Minneapolis, is a 42% increase. Precinct four in North Minneapolis has had a 34% increase. And Southwest Minneapolis is looking at a 41% increase. And that's just for 2020, uh, or in 2020. Even if you don't live in one of these high instance areas, you end up being affected by auto theft. Uh, over 33% of our vehicles stolen in Minneapolis belong to non-residents. Uh, next slide. Uh, the auto theft prevention unit itself, uh, we have two main focuses, which is bait vehicle operations and the, and the recovery of stolen vehicles. We also assist with other carjacking and auto theft details across the city and participate in uh, ongoing investigations involving outside jurisdictions. Um, in 2020, the bait vehicles were deployed for 30 different periods, um, ranging in different lengths of time. Um, in those 30 uh, deployments, there were 72 bait vehicle activations and 31 of those were actually thefts of bait vehicles. Of those 31 vehicles that were stolen, 46 people were charged with offenses. And we are seeing about 70% uh, are adults um, that are committing these offenses. It is, it is to note that of those uh, parties arrested, 57% uh, of them had prior felony convictions and 28% had prior auto theft convictions. Uh, the auto theft Prevention Unit has recovered 141 stolen vehicles in 2020, resulting in a $1.3 million value. Uh, next slide. Uh, what is the bait vehicle program? MPD, we run a cost-effective, proactive approach to combat auto theft and theft from autos with our bait vehicles. Uh, we have been doing bait vehicles since 1998. Uh, this is not new to us. and we are a leader in the field of bait vehicle operations. In 2018, we made significant strides in our equipment that we use, and we purchased new um, software uh, and the monitoring software and devices in the vehicles, uh, really putting us ahead of everybody else in what was available on the market. Uh, the bait vehicle deployments are based on weekly MSTAT data and we are deploying into the auto theft hotspots throughout Minneapolis. Deployments occur in all five pre police precincts matching to the current auto theft trends. We currently have a fleet of eight bait vehicles, and a bait vehicle only records video and audio upon a door and ignition activation. And this alerts MECC to view the software and dispatch squads accordingly. Uh, in this grant cycle, we are looking to add catalytic converter sensors to our bait vehicles, uh, with bait be with catalytic converters being uh, theft being up, you know, 30% um, in 2020. It's just uh, this is going to expand the potential use of our bait vehicles. Um, the ultimate goal of a bait vehicle program is to get criminals to not steal vehicles when the keys are left inside. 
that is a significant problem we have here in Minneapolis with keys being either intentionally left in the ignition or inside of a vehicle as a backup key for them and someone comes along and finds that key. We want them to second guess whether or not this is a bait vehicle and maybe they will pass it up and move on. The uh, next slide, please. Benefits of the bait vehicle program is that we control the bait vehicle. We can stop it. We can remotely shut it off, disable the engine, lock the doors, uh, prevent vehicle pursuits, decreasing the risk to the public, the offender, and the officers. We have found that this interrupts repetitive criminal behavior, um, seeing that the um, majority of our people that we have arrested have prior auto theft convictions and other felony level crimes. We also have noticed in 2020 here, instances of our robbery and carjacking groups over the past year have been utilizing multiple MOs to steal vehicles, including traditional auto theft behaviors. And we've intercepted uh, some of those parties by the bait vehicle program. Uh, next slide. Uh, now this is where our strategic analysis unit and our uh, as we have been, you guys have been discussing our our analysts come into play. Um, this is an example of what they look at to help me determine bait vehicle placement. Uh, if, if you look at this, this is just a graph. The color represents the historical data, and the dots represent current auto thefts during a certain time period. You know, we choose when we're, they're looking at it. This example shows uh, the fifth precinct along Lake Street, and looking at this map. You can see that each of those individual dots is representing an auto theft. Um, you know, ideal placement would probably be along Lake Street in the Pleasant Avenue area. And, you know, since 2018, we really have started to rely heavily upon our analysts to, to create um, data for us that really drives our program on where we place our cars. And it's been very successful. Uh, next slide. Um, the auto theft prevention unit funding has been, for the most part, by this uh, um, the Department of Commerce auto theft prevention grant. Um, like I said, we've been in this grant for over 20 years. Um, we also get assistance from insurance companies who have donated our vehicles that we use as bait vehicles over the years. Uh, the National Insurance Crime Bureau also aids our program with analytical work and notifying us of possible leads on stolen vehicles and where they are in, within the city. Um, without the Minnesota Auto Theft Prevention Grant, the Auto Theft Prevention Unit would not exist as it does today. And this funding is very important to us. And I think, uh, you know, just listening to what was the last presentation here, you know, with this uh, funding, we can do a lot of the things that uh, I think the city needs to move in the right direction for auto theft. Um, I, I know I threw a lot at you there, uh, but that includes my PowerPoint. Um, and I will field any questions. And uh, Joe Adams is available if there's uh, any more of the technical aspect of uh, the crime lab that you may have questions about it. Great, Great thank you. Thank you. I am curious, what is the, what are some metrics of success related to this program? Um, as far as for us, it's seen, you know, obviously we're not seeing a reduction in auto theft, but it's more or less having an opportunity to have less vehicles being stolen with keys in the car or just being able to intercept our problem people in targeting areas that are seeing an influx of auto theft and hoping that we can reduce um, our victims' uh, loss of vehicles and then recovering them in a timely manner for them if they are stolen so they're not without a vehicle for a significant amount of time. Um, our recovery rate has increased significantly um, and that's one of our things we want to continue to do here in the future. Great, thank you. I know that it can be a little bit challenging 
uh, to measure what has been prevented. Because <laughs> um, when issues go up overall, um, you have still prevented things from happening, right? And so it's, it can be a little bit hard to, to measure that. So I'm just curious um, uh, about uh, how do you know when, when you've been successful in the implementation of this program? Um, are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Councilmember Fletcher. Thank you, Chair Cunningham. Um, I, I think I actually talked to Director McPherson about this, but can you refresh my memory? Uh, because this is a grant that we've been receiving for 20 years, this was part of the approved budget, correct? We budgeted to receive this grant, so this is not a um, an increase of the MPD budget from what was projected. Um, I believe Robin can probably answer that best, but I believe that is correct. That's yeah, um, Officer DePaul, I'd be happy to answer it. So we budgeted the grant uh, in the 2021 budget, but because we received additional funding, that's why we're asking for additional appropriation. Um, again, the way these grants work, they're reimbursable grants. So the as we spend the money, we ask for the reimbursement. It's a one for one, basically correlation for that. Yeah. So a portion of it was, I think we've asked, I think I don't have the resolution in front of me, but I want to say that we we missed the budget by about 120,000, something along those lines. Okay. And then historically, how much of the overtime out of that 300,000 gets used by MPD versus other agencies? Or what would you anticipate in terms <clears throat> of the mix of what we're approving? Well, here? Uh, Officer DePaul, correct me if I'm wrong here. I don't want to misspeak. Um, the three hundred thousand uh, dollars out of the grant in this new grant is for other agencies. It is for not for us. Okay, and so that full three hundred is for other agencies. Is that Lance? Is that correct? Uh, yes and no. Um, this is new. We've never had this feature before uh, in the grant. It is something new. The Department of Commerce has asked us to facilitate for them. Um, just so funding is available. Yes, MPD could be could use some of this three hundred thousand dollars if uh, we have an investigation that's auto theft related or carjacking related or catalytic converter relate related something you know that's an auto theft crime. We can petition to to whatever funds that that we think we would need for that investigation, and it would be up for the auto theft prevention uh, board to allocate those funds. Um, being that we are going to be the fiscal administrator, hopefully for this uh, portion of the grant, I think uh, we would be able to access those funds if we find a use for them. So I, I would like to add, and I'm just reiterating something that um, Officer DePaul said, we do not decide how those funds, that 300,000 is spent. Those have to go back to the state for their approval. Uh, it's, not, it's not our decision. Got it, thank you. Great. Well, are there any other questions or comments from my colleagues? Thank you for this presentation. It was uh, very well detailed um, and uh, both presentations. Um, and thank you, Officer DuPaul, for coming today um, before the City Council to be able to explain the work that you lead. Um, very, very helpful information about uh, this particular program that's happening through MPD. Um, I am not seeing any other comments or questions from my colleagues, so I will move approval of item number four. My apologies. Um, I will move approval of item number four and ask the clerk to please call the roll. Councilmember Gordon? Aye. Councilmember Ellison? Aye. Councilmember Cano? Councilmember Palmasano? Aye. Vice Chair Fletcher? Aye. And Chair Cunningham? Aye. There are five ayes. That motion carries and will be moved for forward for next 
Thursday, uh, not Friday to the full city council, because next Friday will be our first uh, Juneteenth uh, as a city holiday. So uh, with that, there is no further business before this committee, and I will just pause to say thank you again uh, to all of the city staff who work day in and day out, um, who are involved with public health and public safety related work, um, community engagement, civil rights. Uh, they are the uh, critical factors of that what help make our city continue moving forward and function. So I just want to make sure to say a special thank you to them. And without objection, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.